we have access to Splunk server, you can actually log in and then take a look at the index files. Of course, you cannot read them. You need search head to do the search and then read them. But that's where these files are organized. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the index, so the Splunk data buckets, and I'm going to just keep this slide. This is probably going to be too, um, 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 too detailed that you may not need to know. Well, if you really want, the data is stored in what we call data buckets. They are nothing but directories inside Splunk indexer. They have the raw data, compressed raw data, index files, and some metadata. Okay, you don't you don't ever have to actually go inside a data bucket. Okay, all right. So hopefully that gave you um, some background on how the Splunk platform works. Right uh, now, uh, please use the Q and A. Um, um, to actually um, uh, post your questions, right? Um, what we'll do is at the end of this segment, we will actually uh, go through the Q&A, okay? All right, <clears throat> with that said, let's, uh, let's jump in to a demo. So what are, we gonna, what are we gonna do here? We're gonna open Splunk, and then we're gonna update details in this segment. Uh, but in the coming segments, of course, we'll be just ripping apart um, searching in general. All right, so I'm going to switch my screen to um, I get It's a fresh vanilla uh, installation. But in your organization, depends on how the administrators have configured, you might get a different page. So wherever I um, implement Splunk, we have some sort of a welcome page. You know, I add um, important links and things like that. I, have, I totally customize this uh, screen per application team you can actually configure different workspaces for different application teams and then customize the welcome page that way too. Um, so just letting you know, this could be different when you log in. Now, before I upload the data, there are some high level uh, things that you need to know. Um, on the top here, what you see is the black bar. This is called a Splunk bar. And this will always be available to you. You can always click on the Splunk Enterprise at the top left to come to up here. Um, sometimes it's, it, I have seen false alerts in here because it has some logic. It always runs some searches in the background, looks at the internal logs, and then brings up uh, this uh, uh, health status, if you will. Right now, it's all nice and green and clean, so we are good. And then here you have um, your, um, um, your name, logged in name. Uh, one thing I want to, I, I suggest everyone to do uh, before, you know, if you have not done it already in your organization, is to click on your name and then go to preferences. So the two things I really want you guys to do is go to SPL editor and then make sure the search assistant is set to full, right? Now, what does search assistant do? Um, it will prompt almost like an um, autofill, what is the word I'm calling? Autocomplete, if you will. Um, it will suggest things. It will provide links to uh, important documentation, etc. Uh, especially when you are learning you know, um, initially, keep the search assistant in full mode. Okay. And then always turn on the line numbers and search auto format. So what they do is, um, here's what will happen. Once you start learning Splunk and then start writing queries invariably your queries will get longer and longer. I have seen like hundreds of lines of one SPL and it's gonna get super, super complex. And, and think about it, if you have to read someone else's query, you'll go crazy. These line numbers and search on the auto format, what it does is it neatly aligns, you know, it provides tabs, almost like IDE if you will, like if you have used Visual Studio Code, um, it color codes things. Um, when, you, when you add a pipe, for example, it automatically brings you to the next line, etc. So I would highly recommend um, making this customization. I have it done all the time, even even myself in my work. Okay, let's go ahead and click apply. Okay, since we were there, I want to show you one other thing. Under global, you see this time zone, right? By default, <clears throat> the time zone will be off your PC, wherever you are, um, wherever you are, uh, you are using your PC, right? Your local systems time zone. 
Now, the data that you collect from your server may not be in your time zone. And this is a discrepancy I always um, get from users. Hey, my logs show like a two hours ahead of time, but in the Splunk time here, it shows the current time. Why is that a mismatch? And um, one thing you need to learn is Splunk will not alter the raw data. It, it cannot. It's just, it's, um, <clears throat> well, when, you, when it receives data, it indexes them by looking at the terms and then stores the data as it is. You can do some index time parsing and then change the data, but we're not talking about that. Once the data is indexed, there is no way to update it because updating, that means rebuilding the index. So you really need to actually re-index the data if you need to, if you want to you know, do uh, an update. So, um, and so with the point I'm trying to drive is it is normal to see the raw data time that's in the logs and then your Splunk time to be different. Because if you search, let's say, for the past 60 minutes from your PC, if the in East Coast, for instance, I'm in Central, but in the East Coast, it's already one hour ahead of time, right? I don't want um, East Coast's last 60 minutes. I want my last 60 minutes, isn't it? So that time, if you look at the raw data, it'll look like as if it's one hour ahead of time because that's the raw log data. <clears throat> but if you really need to match both of them, here is what you do. You come here, and then you change your local time zone to whatever uh, uh, data that you are viewing, if that makes sense. But in most cases, you just want to leave it as it is. <clears throat> yeah, I'll cancel it here. And then here you have some um, inbox messages. I have never used it, actually, so don't worry about it. Now, settings, um, this is huge. Um, Depends on your uh, um, uh, permissions. You might see only some menu here, um, but if you're an administrator, you'll see a lot more, like authentication, system settings, distributed, you know, index or clustering, etc. But for the most part, as a user, you will at least see the knowledge side of things. <coughs> okay, and um, as a matter of fact, we have an, another course called Creating Knowledge Objects. We'll be covering each and every one of these, like, you know, how to create lookups, you know, workflow actions, things like that. In this course, we'll touch on some of those as well. But just letting you know that um, there are a, a pre-built knowledge objects that you can create and customize, um, such as fields and whatnot. Actually, fields are so important. We'll be looking at field extraction in this uh, course. Okay. And then here, there is some help for to the documentation. Um, if you are in a distributed you know, environment, the help um, uh, menu also helps with finding out which Splunk server you have logged on to. So you can click on help and then click about. You will see the server name right here. So in this case, it's corona-mac-local. But you, let's say your cluster is so big and let's say you're having some issues. If you want to talk to the Splunk administrators, this could be one of the useful um, information and if the Splunk administrator is worth the salt, he will ask you this information. What is the server you are connected to? Uh, so, um, yeah, so under the help, you can actually uh, go to about, and then you can look at the server that you're connected to. All right, so now on the left side, you have apps. Now apps, just a little bit about what exactly apps are. Now with apps are everywhere, you know, mobile phones, um, in your iPad, tablet, apps. So in Splunk, what app means is, it, it means two things. One is it's a set of configuration files that you organize in certain way that Splunk expects, okay? Now what, they are used for two major reasons. One is to create new visualization. You can create um, a donut chart, for example, right? Actually, it may already be there as part of uh, native libraries, but let's say you want to create a brand new visualization. Then you have to develop your own, you know, using JavaScript or whatever, and then you can bundle that as an app and then install it on Splunk. So that's one main reason. The second reason is you want to parse the incoming data. Splunk by default will parse all major log files just fine. Things like, you know, Apache web servers log, syslog, um, and, um, you know, like a WebSphere log or WebLogic log, 
um, things like that. <coughs> Splunk will automatically parse it. Windows even fewer logs. It'll automatically parse. But let's say you're working with a new device or a new application. You want you want to tell Splunk how to parse the data, right? You can use an app to do that. So these are the two major reasons. Now, um, it can also be used, I should have said three, to create a workspace on the left side. So um, you can create a, an app, search an app for certain users and then make it available here so that they will only use that app to create their knowledge objects. And you can configure security around app so that if a user doesn't belong to certain groups, then he will not be able to see that app and hence he will not be able to see the knowledge objects. So we are getting a little bit into the security, but uh, um, we can um, we don't have to go into the details of that. But know that it's um, it's how the apps are used. When I click on search and reporting, this is the app that comes by default. Most of the time, well, in this course, this is the app that we'll be using all the time. Um, this app will always be available to you. It may be enough for you to do the search. Um, but if you want to, let's say, create dashboards and reports and you want to share with others, usually the administrators create a separate app for you. Okay? And then that's where you will be creating. So this is a search and reporting app here. Um, now, just a, a quick overview of this, the whole homepage here. This is where you'll be running your search. <clears throat> so as a, as a newbie or, you know, experienced too, um, you'll be spending a lot of time in this field. Right, you'll be running your searches. Um, now there is a time picker here. A little bit more about time picker in the next segment. Um, now there is also a search history. Make use of this because you don't have to retype all the search commands that you type. You can click on search history and then pick any search that you want. Add to search, and there you go. You can search. Okay. And then here you have some documentation link as well. Okay, so now what I want to do is upload some test data so that we can start um, running our searches. I know you are itching to get dive in. Um, let's do this. So how, are, how am I going to add data? We saw in the previous you know, um, few slides that universal forwarder can be used to collect data and then send it. For this demo, we will not use a universal forwarder. We will upload data directly from my Mac into Splunk, and you can do that. Uh, just by going into the add data uh, um, menu here. Now, caution, you may not see this um, menu in your uh, organization. In fact, wherever I go, I disable this. I don't want users to upload like a petabyte of sensitive data into Splunk unknowingly, right? We want to have it come through a pipeline that, you know, that the administrators uh, uh, configure. But because it's a brand new lab install, you can click on that data. Oh, uh, before I go through this, what I want to do is actually delete what I had uploaded earlier. I had actually uploaded the tutorial data earlier. So I want to show you how the data is up, you know, uploaded. For that, I'm going to clean up what I uploaded earlier. So hang with me for 10 seconds here. So index equal to main. Choose all time. Okay, this is all the tutorial data. There is about 100,000 events here. I'm going to delete it, okay? Now, don't even try this in production. Oh, um, okay, so it is telling me that I have I don't have permission. Okay, this is the reason. I am an administrator, but Splunk doesn't want me to delete it. It's because it is so um, dangerous that you can wipe out the index, right? So the way it works is you need to specially grant a privilege. Uh, it's called a can underscore delete. Then only you can delete stuff. Um, I'm 100% sure that your administrators have disabled this. Even administrators themselves exclude um, themselves from this group. So, but it's okay for this. I'm gonna go to settings, users. This is me. And I'm, I'm going to add myself, you know, in the assigned roles, can delete role. Okay. Don't worry if you need to learn all this. I don't think you'll ever have to do this, but I'm just going to just gonna do it. Um, okay. Now I have admin and can delete. So let me retry that. 
let us go to search history to save some time. Okay, uh, make sure you have the right time frame to cover all your data. Okay, so it gives you like a weird output here, but it means it's it's deleted fine. So it deleted it deleted one hundred and nine thousand rows or records, events technically, and then no errors. Okay, great. I can double check by running this command. Zero events. Okay, so let's go back to what we were doing. Uploading data. So I'm going to click on add data. And then I'm going to scroll down here. Come to upload files from my computer. Okay, so now it, it is asking me to select a source. I'm going to click on select file. And then um, choose tutorial data dot zip. Now, um, this uh, file is available in Splunk for you to download. I will post the link in the group chat if you want. Very, very useful. I'm going to actually post the link right now so you don't lose it. You don't have to go and download it now. You just need to follow along with me. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's the link to the tutorial data file. So let's move on here. Okay, so it's, it's complaining that the preview is not supported because it's a zip file. So Splunk can ingest zip files, but I don't usually recommend it because Splunk needs to unzip it and then look at it and that's extra processing. But for this use case, it's fine. Oh, wait. Okay, I already started the file, click on next. Now in the input settings, I wanna maybe uh, give you a couple of pointers here because there is some important terms here. Source type, host, and then the index name, right? Now the source type is how you tell Splunk uh, it, what type of data is being indexed, right? So Splunk can use this to parse the data. Usually um, you create a custom source type and then create some configuration on how to parse the data. At the same time, there are many popular logs that Splunk automatically will um, parse as well. If you don't specify the source type, Splunk will still go out and parse it based on the logic it has, and then it will assign um, some auto-generated source type name. Okay, the source type can be used while you search. We'll see in a minute. When you're searching, you're basically searching key value pair. Index equal to this, source type equal to this, give me all the data for the certain time frame. So source type can also be used while you know searching for filtering your data. The host is the feed is a field that Splunk automatically adds to the incoming data based on which source or the server created that um, that, that event. So um, in my so here um, it, it is already recognized that it's my local uh, PC so I'm, or Mac. I'm going to just update it just by in, I'm just going to remove the Mac local and then I'll just leave it as host value as code. Okay. And the host can also be used to filter your data when you're searching. And then index, to specify which index the data should go to, I'm gonna choose main here. Even if you leave it as default, it will be main. Main is the default index. Uh, you can create a new index here if it's local. I highly doubt that in, in your production environment, you can create index on your own. So your administrators will have to do that. Okay, click review. Okay, it's all good. Click Summit. All right, file has been uploaded successfully. You can start searching now. I'm not gonna click on that yet. I'll just go back to the main screen and bring up search and reporting app and then do the search here. Index equal to main. Um, <clears throat> time frame. I'm gonna use all time because it's an old tutorial data. I think it's 2019 or something. Yep, it is 2019. So um, that's why um, I choose all time in production in your environment all time is a little bit tricky because it's going to pull tons and tons of data so always be specific to your um, be specific about time frame again when we talk about time picker in the next segment I'll give more pointers on that okay so this is great uh, we have the data showing up here okay um, what I want to do is um, 